So we are going live on the Facebook now. Uh, give me a few seconds. Yes, this is now live in the Facebook. Namaste. Good afternoon, everybody. Namaste. We're waiting for right? Oh uh, yes, we ha we are waiting for an Indian uh, panelist. Uh, oh yeah, he's here. Once he's here, then yeah, we we will start. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Omer. Hello. Uh, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Let me just get the video started. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, that's odd. Why is it a. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it seems I'm uh, you have to rotate. flipped around. Rotate it, yeah. Uh, how does one rotate this? Oh, one second. Let me see if I. Uh, yeah, this okay. is a little okay. strange. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Is that working now? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Sorry, I was a little late. I needed to get some things done. Yeah, it is already five minutes, you know, we consume. Uh, so, uh, without any delay, let me start now. <clears throat> Good afternoon, distinguished speakers, fellow participants, and dear colleagues. My name is Yuvraj Solagai. I'm the vice chairperson of the organizing institution, Nepal Institute of International Relations. I will be moderating the webinar of today. Firstly, I would like to request Dr. Risi Raj Adhikari the chairperson of the organizing institution, Nepal Institute of International Relations, to chair this webinar, Dr. Adhikari. Namaste, everybody. Thank you very much, and welcome that you have joined us. Ibrahim, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me say a few words, taking this opportunity about the organizing institution. <clears throat> Nepal Institute of International Relations is an independent, non-governmental organization established in 2019. It has the objective of doing research, publication, and discussion forums on international politics, diplomacy, and foreign relations to support Nepal government to adopt the necessary steps to make Nepal's foreign policy tangible <clears throat> with the changing environment of the world for the betterment of the country and the people of Nepal. Since its formation, it has already organized 17 webinars. And this one is 18th if being counted. Nepal Institute of International Relations is organizing this webinar on the topic of trans Himalayan economic corridor. Today, we will try to go through the idea of economic connectivity of Nepal between China and India, especially opening up the new trade and economic routes across the tough mountain range situated between Nepal and China. We will sit for around two hours with this webinar. Firstly, distinguished speakers 
will deliver their views on the topic for an hour, maybe more than an hour. And there will be a question and answer session followed by the presentation. We request all the participants uh, who have already joined us uh, to post the question from your side on the question and answer box or the, uh, or the chat box uh, right there in front of you in your uh, screen. And we request all the uh, uh, watchers who are watching live us from Facebook uh, to post their questions uh, from, the, from the comment box of the Facebook. This entire program will be uploaded on the YouTube channel as well. And we request all of you to subscribe the channel of NIIR uh, to uh, watch all the programs as well by us. Uh, now, without any delay, uh, let me welcome the speakers of this webinar. <clears throat> uh, firstly, though all the uh, panelists have not uh, joined us, especially the panelists from Nepal, Honorable ex, uh, former, uh, ex Minister for Finance, Mr. Surendra Pandey. Uh, is joining us as uh, he has to uh, join a funeral for his uh, uh, relative of his family. Uh, and so he may be on the way. Uh, I hope he will join us within a few minutes now on. So uh, I request uh, Dr. Wang Peng. Uh, I welcome him here in this webinar. Dr. Wang. Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang is a research fellow and a deputy director of the macro research department of Songyang Institute for Financial Studies, Renmin University of China, Beijing. He holds PhD in international relations. Dr. Wang worked as a researcher in many reported institutions in China and abroad. His major research areas consist of international relations theory, Sino-US relations, Indo-Pacific inter uh, international security, Chinese foreign policy and strategic culture and public diplomacy. He has published both Chinese and English articles in reputed peer reviewed academic journals. Uh, similarly, we have a distinguished uh, speaker uh, from um, India, uh, Mr. Omer Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed, you are welcome here in this webinar. Mr. Omer Ahmed is an Indian writer uh, reporter and political analyst. He is currently working as the managing director for South Asia at uh, the thirdpole.net. Omer Ahmad has worked as a political analyst and journalist over the last decade with a particular focus on the Himalayan region. He holds master's degree in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, India, and Syracuse University, New York, the USA. His published works include the Nobles Encounters and the Storyteller's Tale. He was also uh, he has also written a narrative history of Bhutan, uh, titled "The Kingdom at the Center of the World: uh, Journeys into Bhutan." His most recent publication was a view on the Ayodhya verdict by the Supreme Court of India. Uh, similarly, we have a very prominent scholar from Pakistan. Uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Rasid Aftaf. Uh, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Rasid, in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for, thank for inviting me. Oh, thank you, Pleasure. Dr. Rasid. Dr. Rasid Aftab is a working uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Rasid Aftab is working as a director at. Uh, Rifa Institute of Public Policy, Rifa International University, Islamabad, Pakistan. Dr. Rasid is also a member of Pakistani Prime Minister's Task Force on Jim and Jewelry. Uh, he did his PhD in public policy and governance perspective education uh, from Utrecht University, the Netherlands. He possesses a rich uh, experience of more than 20 years in various public private sectors. He remained involved in uh, various 
ministries and government authorities of Pakistan for the planning and monitoring of the policies of the government of Pakistan. Uh, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Sayer, please check uh, if uh, Mr. Honorable Pandey arrived here. Let's check him. We, the organizers, have already signed the concept note to the distinguished speakers about the topic of this webinar. And we hope our concern is well conveyed to the um, distinguished panelist of this webinar. Today, including the concept and queries covered by the concept note by the organizer, we will be discussing the points raised by the scholars, uh, scholarly participants of this webinar. Before that, let me take this opportunity to say a few words about the topic connecting to the discussion of this webinar. The Southeastern Himalayan subregion and the Ganges Basin is, uh, essentially need a big push in the infrastructure developments, uh, coupled in far more than robust annual economic growth rates to meet the challenges posed by its poverty, mass and massive underemployment of its human capital. Amidst the development and security challenges faced by the Himalayan subregion, the emergence of Asia as a world's economic, economic fulcrum by, led by China, and uh, China that is in the throes of its look east, sorry, look, look west uh, national strategy offers grand opportunities to deal with these challenges. Similarly, India's look east policy with the uh, emerging personality uh, in terms of economic and political sector is vital to this spectrum. Uh, though both the big Asian giant, literally the Asian dragon and the elephant, share a large range borders to uh, each other, but at the same time, both of them have long-standing tough issues on borders, which may take more time to resolve. The concept of cross Himalayan economic corridor from China to India through Nepal is a pretty good idea in this context. China and India are the largest economies, as already mentioned. Both of them can have even better future situation in terms of security and a smooth trade route perspectives by making the common neighbors, uh, Nepal, as transit points through the concept of trans Himalayan economic corridor, as they have long standing border dispute uh, in the most of the Northeast and Northwest border lines. China's experience with Pakistan and Myanmar to connect the huge mass of people and land through the economic corridor with multidimensional uh, connectivity concept can be good reference to this context. The existence of uh, top pilgrimage area like Lumbini, Pasupati and Mount Everest and several other top mountains along with the heavenly natural places, the high potential of minerals and natural resources, probable location of the use factor installation are some of the features of the viability of the huge connectivity through Nepal. This is a vital point that needs to be seriously noted by the big neighbors. The poor neighbor uh, can, uh, can always be a cause of geographical threat for the, for the path ahead if it is left isolated behind out of the holistic development mainstream. So the collective effort is price worthy for the um, game changer trans Himalayan economic corridor taking Nepal in the center. With those short comments, we would like the distinguished speakers to address these queries. Is the concept technically viable, economically maintainable, and geopolitically acceptable in the current situation? What are the uh, potential hurdles of the trans Himalayan economic corridor? Are there um, feasible and viable corridors across the Himalayas, which could be developed into vibrant economic zones to enhance the lives and livelihoods of the people of the corridor area? Is the concept of trilateralism viable to Nepal, India, and China? Will initiation of trans-Himalayan corridor invoke any political backlash in the re reason taking into consideration the current state of affairs between China and India? Can Nepal manage itself to address 
the security concerns of the Zant neighbors to implement this concept? What role Nepal should play to start implementing this project? What major potential areas of economic exchanges are there with this economic corridor? What can be the possible effects of uh, India not being officially part of Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? So, <clears throat> uh, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, now without any delay, with these all the comments and raising few uh, questions uh, to the panelists, I'm now turning towards the speakers uh, for the deliberation. Uh, firstly, uh, I, may I uh, call uh, Dr. Rasid Aftaf uh, for the deliberation. Dr. Rasid, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I really, uh, I'm honored uh, and highly obliged that uh, uh, Nepal Institute of International Relations has given me an opportunity uh, uh, in this uh, uh, very uh, important webinar uh, on Trans-Himalayan Economic Corridor. I think uh, this webinar has been arranged uh, uh, in a very crucial time when the, when the Nepal and China are going to uh, uh, execute uh, this MOU, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is very much important and significant uh, uh, for the, for the uh, whole mountainous area. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I think uh, let's, uh, uh, let's go through a little bit background, uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, this region. When uh, uh, stands the heart of the crucial ge geopolitical situation emerging between Asia and rising powers. And uh, the, the trans himalayan region extends, I think, about uh, 1,500 miles and uh, traverse India, Bhutan, China, Nepal, and Pakistan. And uh, sometimes this uh, Himalaya is also called as a Asia, Asia's uh, water tower. Uh, why it is called it is a water tower? Because the 10 major rivers uh, have their sources in the Himalayan uh, glaciers and the snow fields. And uh, I believe about uh, more than 210 million people in the mountain range, in more than 2 billion across Greater Asia, draw their water supplies from its river system, which is very uh, much crucial. Uh, because uh, water is the lifeline uh, of not only for the human beings, but as far as uh, the agriculture and other use of uh, for fresh water. Further, uh, the rising demands uh, caused by the population growth and urbanizations, environmental degradations, and sustainable consumption practices have, pract have placed unprecedented strains on the crucial freshwater resources and threat, threaten to impair economic development, undermine food security, uh, compromise public health, and potentially upset the regional stability. As far as the trans-Himalayan multidimensional connectivity, which is also called as uh, THMCN, uh, is an economic co corridor between uh, Nepal and China. And parts of China, and it is a parts of China's belt and road initiative, BRI, and which is a global development initiative that develops connectivity, especially across Euro-Asia. And Pakistan is a part of BRI uh, through uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which was uh, uh, signed in, uh, in 2015. And now we are uh, entering into the second phase of uh, uh, Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, because significant uh, achievement has already been done uh, in the first phase with respect to the infrastructure development and the energy projects. Now we are entering into the second phase, which is more focused on the development of the special economic zones uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the country. And uh, by seeking to establish the Trans-Himalayan Economic Corridor with Nepal, together with the China-Pakistan Economic Cor Corridor, I think Beijing is aiming to create an alternative to Kathmandu's for trade and movements of goods. 
alternative, obviously, the reliance of uh, Kathmandu on India will be minimized. And uh, Beijing also proposed uh, a more inclusive trans-Himalayan economic corridor to Delhi as well uh, to develop a tri trilateral or the multilateral approach. I think it was uh, the proposal was uh, uh, placed somewhere in 2014 or 15. Uh, uh, and uh, I, st I, I think uh, the economic, uh, uh, this is my firm opinion that the economic corridors are excellent confidence building investments to deal with the emergent mag mega risks from the impending water security caused by the climate change and global warming and the inevitability of complex disputes. Uh, among the riparians, and they, those riparians may be of uh, any riparian, uh, ri maybe upper riparian, middle riparian, or riparians. So uh, whenever there is a, a sharing of uh, natural resources among the riparians, always there are disputes and uh, challenges uh, with respect to the sharing mechanism of uh, that particular uh, precious resource. And uh, although the project uh, will raise the livelihood of the people living in the mountainous areas, however, when the powers are not equal, uh, sometimes the resources are not equitably distributed. So some of the key areas to be considered, uh, including obviously one is the security, uh, second is the regional connectivity, uh, third, maybe water use, usage and climate uh, change. And uh, fourth is the cultural uh, preservation, including the protections of women and the minorities. And uh, further, the cooperation in the new frontiers, such as, for example, human capital development is also required. Uh, uh, the planning and management of corridors should be for institutional formation of transporters, industrialists, uh, traders forming alliances uh, and creating alliances between the cities along the corridor and discovering networking mechanism between the institutional platforms. Uh, for the Himalayan subregion, it must be envisioned the rivers as the bedrock of sub-regional cooperation for harmonious development with peace and security uppermost in mind. This would require that the uh, economic corridor focus on agriculture and agro-processing, forestry and forestry products, uh, mining and minerals products, water sources engineering, construction engineering, science and technology, and a research and development for creation of world-class intellectual capital, among others, as priority areas. And uh, market must be integrated, uh, which is very important, and supported by the financial cooperation through institutional support. I, being a policy person, uh, recommend uh, some of the policy initiative, which may be uh, considered uh, for this webinar as for as uh, for the other stakeholders and i am so happy that uh, nepal institute of international relation although uh, what uh, i have been told by the london speaker earlier that uh, in 2019 it has been constituted and uh, within a, a, a short span of one year it has arranged so many webinars and this platform is a non-partisan platform and uh, independent platform which advise uh, the, uh, the government in terms of the foreign policy in context with the politics, diplomacy and international relations. And obviously the, uh, what we are discussing today, it, is, uh, it, uh, it involves uh, everything. It, inv it involves politics, it involves international relations and it, it involves uh, diplomacy and uh, diplomacy of various uh, uh, nature uh, diplomacy. So uh, uh, my, uh, 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 my recommendations may be, number one, pursuing a closer ties among the sharing countries. 
uh, and second is engaging in a more hands-on approach regarding trans-Himalayan connectivity to support development that serves the people of the region. So the, the focus has to be the people of the of uh, of that particular region. So whatever the development we do, the, it has to be people-centric development instead of a top-to-bottom approach. Third, maybe the sharing of information and helping uh, build infrastructure to foster cooperation in distributing water resources as well as providing aid to combat uh, the weather events, uh, extreme weather events. Fourth is uh, uh, empowering local civil society groups and supporting uh, grassroots solutions uh, instead of going a very high tech solution which can uh, very may in some cases may uh, in, uh, may be difficult to uh, implement those. So we have to support the grassroots solutions to combat inequality. And uh, in the last, uh, I think uh, the international diplomacy, conservation, and community-driven development can help uh, mitigate drivers of insecurity and deliver mutual benefits to all the countries engaged in the Himalaya region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rasid, for your uh, in-depth uh, comments on the issue. We will come back to you uh, on the question and answer session. So please join, uh, stay, join us. Uh, now it's uh, time to turn to another speaker. So I would like to request uh, uh, to deliver his uh, presentation uh, to Mr. Omer Ahmed. You, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, can please. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be part of this discussion. Um, these are things that my organization, um, the Third Pole, covers in depth. Um, as, uh, as Dr. Aftab said, um, more than 2 billion people are dependent on the rivers that flow across the Himalayan region, but comparatively little is uh, said or discussed about them. Transboundary cooperation exists, but it is weak. And uh, there is a huge uh, desire for development, for financial inclusion, um, for uh, people getting out of poverty in the region. Uh, these are all important aspects. Overlooking them all, unfortunately, is the issue of security, which is that uh, there are contested borders within the region. Uh, there are old uh, and new uh, issues among the countries. And uh, that, has an, um, uh, that has an important impact on how much one can cooperate or how one cannot. I'm going to share within this chat an article I wrote last year. And uh, this is looking at how the Himalayan region could uh, replicate some of the uh, issues um, and some of the successes um, that the Arctic region has uh, managed to do. And uh, this was in the context of uh, the Arctic Frontiers Conference where I was uh, there last year. It is held annually and it basically brings everybody from the eight countries around the Arctic region, uh, policymakers, diplomats, scientists, as well as civil society to discuss what are the issues of the region. The, and that has been going on for some while. And during that, uh, during that conference, I was talking to one of my Chinese counterparts and uh, we were discussing uh, with a Norwegian uh, uh, foreign ministry person and we were discussing the need of similar cooperation in the Himalayan region. Uh, and uh, uh, my Chinese counterpart who was a somewhat senior academic um, said that, yes, this is very necessary, but if China takes the first step, it will be seen as uh, with suspicion. And that's exactly the same if India takes the first step. 
any initiative that is started by any of the larger countries surrounding the Himalayan region will be seen with suspicion by everybody else. Whether that suspicion is correct or not, let's not go in there. Suspicion is the nature of countries when looking at contested borders. That is how it will be. That said, I'm really glad that the Nepal Institute of International Relations is having this conversation because if we are to get beyond it, it will require leadership from countries in the middle, countries like Nepal, who uh, will be, whose leadership is less threatening to any of the other countries. As long as it's seen to be an independent point of view. And for that to happen, we need a number of things to take place. And I completely agree with uh, Dr. Aftad that the markets have to be brought into the issues. But they can only be brought into the issues if we actually know what is the state of the region itself. Now, uh, a of the 2 billion people or so dependent on these 10 rivers, uh, one point, uh, uh, how many? No, about 250 million are mountain communities. So that's, but, and these 250 million, whether in Afghanistan or in China or in Nepal, in the more the mountainous regions or in India are among the poorer communities in South Asia. So the mountain communities of Pakistan are poorer than the plains communities of Pakistan. Similarly, the mountain communities of India are on the whole poorer than the plains communities of the, of the country. And that means that quite often the decisions made are made by financial or market or government actors that are influenced more by more financially powerful regions and not the mountain regions. So the question is, how do we develop a voice for the mountainous regions, which is locally informed, but is and is not overwhelmed by the countries in which they are part of? Of course, there'll be a part of those countries. Uh, and as I've written in the, in the article, uh, which I've shared, one of the things which I was really impressed by was that there was a meeting of the mayors of the Arctic in, uh, in the region. Now this was done by the mayors themselves. These are, uh, and the Arctic includes America, it includes Russia, it includes Canada, it includes Denmark, it includes Norway. So there are very powerful countries who have problems with each other, but there are also much smaller countries uh, which are, le are leading in and of themselves. So my question would be, can we not have a meeting of mayors of Lhasa, Kathmandu, Thimpu, of Peshawar, and sit down and talk about what are the problems with these large cities and what are the challenges as well as what are the opportunities for the cities themselves? Now, obviously that will have some nationalism in play, but if you can lower the conflict level and you're talking about city development, urban challenges, and like the Arctic, the Himalayan region is affected by climate change more than the rest of the world. And these are the youngest mountains in the world Therefore, they, are, they have a particular sensitivity. We can pursue large infrastructure uh, projects like uh, CPEC is doing in, uh, in through the BRI, but, or the high-speed rail. But you have to bear in mind that these are very fragile mountains. If you do massive infrastructure, what you will do is also make the communities in these regions incredibly vulnerable to landslides, uh, to, uh, to uh, just uh, having a lack of access to 
their the things that they had of themselves and one of the things that people don't often talk about is how rich the region in the hindu kush himalayan region uh, is when it comes to biodiversity and this biodiversity is critically threatened by climate change but this biodiversity uh, forms the basis of a large amount of possible pharmaceutical possibilities we know across this region how many local uh, drugs are manufactured based on local knowledge these need to be patented these need to be part of the himalayan solution to the challenges of uh, of the world uh, in terms of medicine and that is a hugely profitable sector what it requires though is an incredible amount of scientific research joint research across borders and somebody has to take the lead on that my my personal thing as somebody sitting in delhi is i would love to see nepal sit up and take leadership on this role and not be reduced to merely an actor where you know somebody is saying china is pushing it to do this or india is pushing to do this or america is pushing it to do this it would be really nice to know what nepal wants and to let nepal also take that leadership role and uh, see how it can help the other countries around its region collaborate in a meaningful matter that does not make its own marginalized mountain communities more vulnerable and i'm going to stop at that thank you thank you so much mr omer uh, you have a very vast knowledge i guess on the area of trans himalayan cooperation and there are the things uh, basically uh, taking in the himalayas center uh, we will come back to you with some questions after the presentation round so uh, with uh, this uh, i may i request uh, dr wang ping for his presentation dr wang please unmute you can do please please unmute you you have to you have to unmute can you hear me oh yeah yeah is yeah. that right yeah. okay 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 better better uh, so uh, thank you thank you very much for invitation uh, it's my greatest honor to uh, sit here and uh, delivering my uh, presentation the, the topic here is yes yam between two boulders promoting nepal's centrality through parallel cooperation amid rising uh, sino indian rivalry uh, no offense i just uh, uh, use this to say uh, in an objective way to describe the situation and i'm trying to stand uh, at the point of the host nepal try to stand in their use their perspective of view to look at the current situation and trying to find some useful way for Nepal, as well as Nepal's bilateral ties with its neighbors. So why here I say the word centrality? That's because two weeks ago, I also joined a conference with my friends in Jakarta, you know, ASEAN people, ASEAN officials, scholars, they're always talking about the centrality, centrality of ASEAN in uh, previously, they just say centrality of ASEAN in Pacific. Now they say in Indo-Pacific, it's because Indian become more and more important. The Indian Ocean in gr uh, growing importance in world economy and politics. So now they are also talking about this. And uh, um, I think there are something similar that um, considering China, US, strategic contest currently. ASEAN people also worrying about their position between two giants, China and the US. Now, maybe as the host and uh, as another two professors just now, uh, as they have mentioned, yes, Nepal also stay uh, between 
uh, a, a yam between two, two boulders and how to make it grow uh, stronger and robust uh, that depends on uh, both the its own stra uh, strategy of development as well as the environment, the, its neighbors. So that's why I choose this topic. And uh, the major body of my presentation is very clear, three parts, problem, reasons, and solutions. Problems, I think now, uh, we have named a long list of the some um, disadvantages of China-Nepal cooperation, India-Nepal cooperation, Pakistan-Nepal cooperation, all of them. Um, and for me, I think if we put all of this, that's we, we blame that we criticize all the problems. One thing I can make summary that's it seems that we are talking saying more more words than action, certainly than effort, than the real final effort. We, we have a lot of, if you search uh, in either Chinese or English engine, you search Chinese uh, articles, newspapers, especially uh, last year and during the past, I think past five years, the Chinese leaders met with Nepal, uh, Nepalese uh, leaders and they signed uh, MOU to promote the uh, China, uh, Nepal, Indian corridor, and a lot of the regional uh, development corporations. That's very good. And certainly they are taking actions, that's true. But it seems that uh, the real effort, still there's a long distance between the efforts that we, we want to get and uh, the current situation. Why? now came to my analysis of the reasons. Uh, I invented a word, we say maybe Nepal dilemma. No, no offense, I just used this word to represent my preliminary thinking about this situation. Or in another word, I may say, there, it seems that there is a non-impossible triangle here between China, Nepal, Indian, and other neighbors uh, in Pan Himalaya region. Three, the triangle, yeah, three point. One, infrastructure development. The other, economic and social development. And the third one, that's the strategic distrust. These three elements uh, interacted with each, each other and made the major problem I have just mentioned why we, we are talking more we say too much but it seems that the effort is still very limited Let, let's we can look at the three major uh, elements infrastructure we know that uh, this mountain country uh, in, in Nepal and so and uh, it's in the world there no no port uh, connected to the sea to outside and also for China the, the Tibetan, is also less development, uh, Western province in China. Uh, India, the, 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 the province near Nepal is also ha have the similar problems. Uh, so we are talking about how to make a uh, rail or make a high speed way to link and advance the airport uh, and so on to connect uh, Nepal with the two rising economy, India and uh, China and as well as with the world. That's very good. That's what we want to do. And this, why? For the second element, that's development. And however, the third point is uh, strategic distrust because lack of uh, mutual trust, especially lack of China, India, mutual distrust. So, you know, the infrastructure, what, whatever the leaders, or engineers, they try to make their building of infrastructure less political. But all kind of infrastructure building, it, it's naturally political. For example, you say you, you build a railway, link this country with others, and maybe other neighbors, they were concerned. They would think, is that potential, something threat or dangerous? That's the same. A um, hundred years ago, that, that's it. So we, we know the 3B railway, 
by Germany and uh, uh, triggered uh, Great Britain and, and so on. So people may worry about that. And so here, the strategic distrust constrained all people's demand of the inf infrastructure building. And uh, for the economic development and infrastructure building, uh, if the, the area, the place is rich or it's high productivity, it has a lot of goods to import and they, the local guys, I mean, local guys in Nepal, in Tibet, Tibet, in Northern India, they have naturally, naturally a demand for trade, for exchange with each other. That's okay, that's, that's okay. Maybe don't need uh, Nepalese, uh, Chinese, Indian government to take a national investment. But right now, still, we, we find it very little effort, little force from the pure market. So they still need the force, need the money from the government, from the country, and then come back to the third one, strategic distrust. So we, we see all these three elements get together and make things worse and worse. So how to make some solutions? Uh, forgive me, I'm not the, <laughs> the the decision maker, I'm just a grassroots uh, scholar, but I can share my preliminary uh, thinkings and try to get your uh, uh, feedbacks. Maybe number one, think about a two coexisting market. Why I say this? It, it, it's, uh, yes, uh, the copyright from Stalin, <laughs> you know, after Second World War uh, and uh, entry the Cold War says, uh, yes, capitalism country and socialism country to parallel markets, one get one, two. Uh, certainly now, up to now we say that's wrong. That, that's not good for Russian, not good for Soviet Union's economy as well as not for world peace, yes. But if we say currently, if I were Nepal, Nepal uh, decision maker, I think right now I, I have no uh, true effort to peace the, the China, Indian, let them no struggle, make them come like, like friends right now. I think it, it's very hard. Maybe China and India, this uh, rivalry will stay for, for some more months or years. So we have to face the reality. Uh, if I were Nepal, Nepal people, I will face this reality and try to make our own development strategy on the true basement. Um, so this, uh, that, what this mean? That's mean two-sided cooperation. That's the topic of my presentation. Try to separate them. I'm in Nepal. I cooperate with China. I do a lot of trade. All right, all right, that's, that's okay. I will not sacrifice my friendship with Indian people uh, to, to, to please China. That's uh, vice versa. That's the same. I will not follow in. Uh, I can do a lot of trade, cooperation, culture, education, exchange with Indian friends. That's okay. Uh, but I will not sacrifice uh, our potential development uh, uh, with, with China. So here we may compel Nepal and Mongolia. Maybe Nepal will envy Mongolia. Yes, Mongolia also surrounded by two great countries, but the two grand countries, they're friends. At least, at least uh, right now, after 1990s, the China, Russia, very good. So they, they, Mongolia do not need to choose side between Moscow and Beijing, but Mongolia try to find the third friend, try to jump jumped out with, uh, with America and other countries. That's another case. For Nepal, maybe situation is a little bit worse. This, uh, it has, an, maybe not right now, but it has the potential threat, potential danger to choose side. And uh, all my friends from Nepal, I have met them. When we talk about this, all of them say, that's, that's not good for Nepal. They don't want it. They, won't, they don't want it two sides, the same as ASEAN people. I ask them, they say they don't want two sides between China and the US. And then second, I would like to say, 
the two parallel market, two parallel lines, all right? But actually, they still have the joint port. The joint port is Nepal, the interceptment, that is Nepal. And this joint point is the source of Nepal's centrality. I use the same sentence to talk with my ASEAN Jakarta uh, Indonesian people. That's you, you try to hold your own sovereignty, hold your, your own power to make choice. That's all the choice made by yourself, not persuaded or not forced by anyone either side, either neither China nor the US. And then you get the centrality. That's what you want. And here, the third one, how to make this? Every great power want to, you know, throw weight around <laughs> China and the, U U the United States, all of them. So how to make this? The third one, I say, there must be some good manner of big countries. That's use your way, use your money, use your resource to persuade the rather than compulsory. So here, I think maybe Nepal, along with SDG, with the UN, with international society, may lead your agent agenda of the international conference to make the moral power of Nepal to lead the conference for what? For let join, take your hands with China, with India, and may, maybe other neighbors to, to sign that every, everyone get a promise, get all that no one get intervention to each other mutually must respect each other's sovereignty, uh, autonomy, especially China and India must respect uh, Nepal's sovereignty. No intervention to the domestic affairs, including domestic uh, election, domestic uh, decision-making of uh, what kind of projects and, uh, and the lot. And in this way, use this international morality, moral power, to enhance uh, Nepal's centrality in this affair, I think maybe it is possible, uh, a possible solution. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All comments welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang Pei, for your prolific and timely um, presentation on the issue. We will come back to you with some questions later after this presentation on finances. Now, <clears throat> We have uh, another panelist. Uh, he um, lately joined us because of some unavoidable circumstances that have happened to his family. Uh, so we are sorry that uh, he lost his aunt today uh, with uh, paying tribute to her late aunt. I would like to welcome to uh, Honorable Mr. Uh, Surendra Pandey. Uh, Mr. Pandey, first of all, I would like to welcome you uh, here in this webinar. Uh, I guess you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> and uh, having, having said with this, let me introduce him first, uh, shortly and then he will uh, deliver his presentation. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Surendra Pandey was a uh, Minister for Finance in 2008 and is an incumbent member of parliament of Nepal. Uh, he has been one of the key political figures in the ruling Nepal Communist Party, who is currently a standing committee member of the party. Uh, he was the member of first and second constituent assembly in Nepal uh, that promulgated the new main law uh, of the country, the constitution, uh, paving the new way of the path ahead. Uh, previously, he served as a member of national assembly uh, the dignified upper house of Nepal in 1999. Uh, well known for his uh, knowledgeable personality, Mr. Pandey is a regular contributor to the different newspapers of Nepal. Uh, now having said with this in his uh, uh, introduction, uh, we are honored with his presence here today. Now uh, I would, may I request uh, Mr. Honorable Mr. Surendra Pandey for his presentation on the topic. Mr. Pandey. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuvraji. And uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Nepal Institute for International Relation for organizing this webinar on this very important topics, which is very much related with Nepal, as well as the neighboring country, 
India, China, Pakistan, and the, the, in the South region uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank NIR, NIIR, Nepal Institute of International Relations, for organizing such an important webinar with eminent scholar involving in this uh, webinar uh, <clears throat> from the great neighbors, uh, China, India, Pakistan, uh, and Nepal. Uh, and uh, I also like to thank inviting me to present my opinion on the given topics. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't attain in the, in the starting. I was uh, uh, out of the Kathmandu due to my family problem. Uh, my aunt passed away yesterday and uh, it was out of my capacity to stay here from the starting uh, to hear the opinion of the learned people. I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I got few uh, uh, opinion and a statement and just I'm hearing of two gentlemen just before presenting the opinion, Peng Wang and the other gentlemen uh, from India, maybe. Omar. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we uh, Asian should be proud of having two great nations with not only the largest population, but also the enormous economic and natural resources, glorious history, culture, and economic successes. We have other neighbors, Bangladesh, Myanmar, with sizable population and natural resources as well. Likewise, we have Nepal and Bhutan with unique geographical and religious richness. Thus, we have a lot of uniqueness and commonalities on the one hand and diversity on the other hand. These countries comprise 42.2% of the world population in which China and India's share alone is 36.17%. This population is the consumer and the producer as well as the human resources. In other words, this is the market of goods and services. Here lies the largest market in the narrowest geographical area, not found in any other region of, of the world. However, these countries combined the GDP is less than one fifth, 19.20% of the world GDP. Out of this, China alone occupies 15.12%. That is 14.343 trillion GDP, the second largest economy of the world. This is the manifestation of the size of the economies of the rest of the countries. This means that we have, to, we have a long way to go to attain a respectable level of economic progress. And I, it is quite possible in light of the size of the market and the enormous resources, if we, can, if we can join hands with the right policy and planning. Only in the Northern part of the India, there are 450 million people. That is very big size of the uh, population of the, uh, not only in this region, in the, uh, in the world also and very big market also. Even now, large number of our, our, our population in South Asia are living below the poverty line. Literacy and life expectancy are equally low. Unemployment and underemployment is excessively high. In other words, we are quite low in other human development index. And I think we should not tolerate such backwardness anymore. We have enough resources in our countries. Only lacking is our cooperation and commitment towards the, our people. Prosperity should be our motto, keeping everything behind. Economic progress 
should be our overarching objective keeping misunderstanding in other area, areas under the carpet we have such a huge market in our vicinity and we should not go any far in search of market therefore if we join hands to prosper collectively we can do the miracle in shortest possible time as far as the concept of trans himalayan economic corridor is concerned it seems to me that this is a noble as well as ambitious idea it is equally challenging and a long term project which demands in strong commitment of the respective governments for several years it is not impossible however china has recently come up, come up with the belt and road initiative and nepal has joined it from the beginning along with pakistan and bangladesh from the south asia to develop the connectivity in all continents 120 countries have joined hands for, so far in this initiative since the bri is meant for mutual benefits there is no room for apprehension if we believe that it benefits us and serves our interest we should take it positively as far as the north south economic corridors across himalayan is concerned there are some issues involved in it first it is quite difficult to pass as the previous speaker discussed and vulnerable being mountains in a hilly region and prone to flood and landslide second those areas are sparsely populated in the upper part and the lack of the connectivity and the settle among the settlements third proper handling of these corridors require huge management capacity which nepal need develop and nepal should put a lot of efforts to develop capacity to maintain safety and the security of these structures this being this being so development of these corridors corridor would be costly as well as time consuming however if we have the commitment nothing is impossible and lot of works have, have already been done on chinese side nepal should be super active to realize this mega objective on account of the limited arable land and unfriendly weather condition people of those areas migrate to urban areas of nepal and also outside nepal and once those areas become accessible and economic activities grow they are likely to return to their birthplace trade and other agro activities will definitely flourish in those areas once dependable and safe connectivity is developed before trilateralism come into force china and india should sort out their differences once and for all looking at the current situation it does not seem likely in the near future once the thick the trans himalayan economic corridor initiative is agreed upon by the participating countries the question of any backlash does not arise only the thing is that there should be good understanding among the countries concerned before this idea is put into effect and outside bri china and india are de deeply engaged in trading in 2019 and 20 their total trade volume stood at 81.86 billion dollar resulting in the trade deficit of 48.66 billion to india therefore i see no reason for india to be apprehensive to bri if the project is beneficial to them and i will add one one to one or two things that this age is is of digital economy recently due to the covid 19 effect there is a tendencies of contact business you know previously we used to engage in the contact business due to this the covid effect the people are now involving in the contact business that, that means online and other everything is coming on online physically they are this in distance but they are working together this type of trend and tendency is coming up everywhere in nepal also as a backward country we are going 
we are teaching by online online teaching in the schools like, like we are discussing here yes like this discussing today uh -huh. similarly uh, we are uh, ordering the goods through the online the goods will arrive in the home not in the shops or not in the marketplace we, we are not in the in the marketplace physically we are not standing each other in the marketplace this type of trend is coming up and a cashless society is coming up in in front of our door uh this blockchain uh blockchain and uh, digital a uh, virtual currency is going to be the main form of exchanging each other the form of the currency and this cash note and uh, coins is going to disappear very soon that is the coming up uh and now the why i am discussing on this issue due to this reason there is the less possibility of the atomic warfare or conventional warfare due to this the uh, technological changes and innovations if possible only the cyber cyber warfare so the great nations they are competing each other who will win who will capture the knowledge in their hand that is the new form of competition nowadays and that's why if these countries they think uh <clears throat> india china bangladesh nepal we can reduce our differences and we can join hand together and surrounding other countries these are this is the largest market in the world and we if we can see our strength ourselves then we can be one of the richest part of the world in this century that is the 21st century of asian century so uh, my my request is uh, to all the political leaders to the intellectuals to experts and uh, the people of this region should join hand together and we have, we have to seek our possibilities our strength and we we have to analyze we have to see our weaknesses and we have to uh, we have to go in the forward looking way then uh, this uh, trans himalayan economic corridor can be or uh, this dream will be realized in a practical way we can uh, we can have practically a uh, new situation uh, in our uh, countries or in this region uh, and we have to be benefited uh, from this idea so we have to hand <coughs> we have to give hand each other and we have to work together this is the most needed issue of this time i think uh, so we have to work together uh, i appeal to all of the politicians and other uh, other personalities to work on in this direction then uh, we can uh, we will be benefited and we will uh, <coughs> we will be center of the this economy and the other issues of this planet uh, and uh, we can we can reduce uh, or we can uh, in reach these places and uh, this poverty and uh, other issues will be eliminated soon uh, so uh, join hand together and uh, i think uh, I, i give uh, i i i apprehend i i i appreciate this initiative taken by this institution as well as uh, yuvraj ji uh, keep it up i always support and uh, all the gentlemen participating in this conference uh, webinar uh, and this is the first maybe you have done in the past also we should continue this type of dialogue in the future also then we can have certain result we can get result because if we continuously work in certain with certain commitment one or another day we can reach in the destination in the in our goal thank you thank you so much honorable mr pandey for your uh, presentation with a very optimistic portrait uh, about the asia and the region and nepal as well um, so uh, now without any delay we would uh, like to go uh, to the another uh, segment 
of the webinar, the question and answer session. And for that, I would like to ask, uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Pandey. Uh, here are two questions exactly that has been mentioned in the concept note. I would just like to repeat that, repeat that two, two questions for you, Mr. Pandey. Uh, uh, what do you, you, you portray uh, the uh, very positive aspect of the uh, regional and trans uh, Himalayan uh, cooperation, uh, the economic corridor, uh, but uh, what do you think the potential hurdles uh, of the cooperation, uh, you know, that you just mentioned uh, in your presentation? What are the hurdles? What are the major hurdles? One, and another, uh, 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 can Nepal take initiative uh, to to start this uh, type of uh, you know uh, cooperation, uh, addressing the issues, especially the security issues of uh, the two giant neighbors of Nepal? So please address these two queries first, and then we will go to another uh, panelist. Thank you. Uh, please unmute. You are muted. I cannot hear you. Okay. It's yeah. Okay. No, okay. It's okay now. Uh, yes. Uh, regarding your uh, queries, questions, uh, I would I, I like to uh, say uh, we have the uh, bottleneck is one of the most uh, up to now. The bottleneck is infrastructure. We don't have uh, the road access, railway connectivity, and other active other infrastructure. There is no uh, electricity and other uh, transmission. These are this is the one of the uh, noted uh, bottleneck of this uh, thick initiative or possibility of the thick. So we have to address in this issue in. With, the, with giving a special priority. Second issue is mistrust. As, you, as the speaker, previous speaker also mentioned, that should be also, uh, should give attention to, to address the mistrust because the present uh, world is the world for open for the all. That is the globalized world. We can't uh, go back to the previous uh, uh, centuries, like closing the all to outsiders. And due to this, as, as I already said, the digital world, digital type of uh, <coughs> connectivity, each other cannot be blocked by any national boundary. So we have to work, we have to reduce our mistrust and we have to start from where we have been, where, we, where, where is our benefit, where is our, uh, uh, from this initiative, where we can be benefited. That should be our entry point. That should be our the discussion point for each other. If that can be done, maybe in one meeting will not be settle out, second meeting, third meeting, fourth meeting, then we can have certain solution from that interaction and a meeting. So that is another thing. Third is, third challenge is finance. Certainly we need very huge money. For this also we have to work together. As a Nepal is a poor country, we can't fund uh, the money as, as, as the necessity of the infrastructure and the other things. So all these things we have to discuss each other, infrastructure, mistrust, and lack of money. This issue should be coordinated and this issue will be discussed in coordinated way. Then we can have the certain solution, I think. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pandey. Uh, similarly, um, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Amir Ahmed. Uh, I guess uh, he can hear me, though he's muted and he, he cannot be seen here. Oh, all right, he's there. <clears throat> uh, it seems uh, that uh, 
it, it seems that uh, after China uh, focused uh, her attention uh, to the uh, uh, Western part of China, especially the Tibetan region, they have invested huge amount of money there and they have made a lot of infrastructure development as well. Uh, it seems that uh, the relation uh, between India and China is getting worse. Do you think that uh, the, um, uh, you know, uh, the focus of China uh, on Himalayan, you know, uh, region or near the Himalayan region uh, is the problem to, uh, you know, cooperate between uh, India and China? Uh, do you think any you know difficulty from especially the Indian side, uh, you know um, about that kind of you know Chinese activities in the region, and uh, is there any kind of you know forthcoming problems uh, for this kind of initiative that can be you know taken uh, for the prosperity of the people of the region, especially the you know um, uh, the river basin that has been immersed from the Himalayan region. So what is your observation and assessment about this, uh, you know, very, uh, um, you know, this, this topic? So, uh, so okay, let's, let's be realistic. Uh, India and China have the longest border dispute in the world. It's three and a half thousand kilometers long. It is not going to be easy to resolve. It hasn't been resolved in 70 years and it's not going to be resolved tomorrow. It's not going to be resolved day after tomorrow. It's not going to be resolved next year it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, now, there's also a historical reason for this. Uh, as long we can talk about it as a historical border, but actually many of those regions were uh, until colonial times, um, relatively independent, whether we're talking about Tibet, whether we're talking about Ladakh, we're talking about Kashmir, these were not regions necessarily fully integrated into either of the great countries. And um, China, if you draw a line across it through the center, 90% of the population lives on the east side and only about 10% lives on the western side. So therefore there hasn't really been, we can talk about the Silk Route historically and all of that, but there hasn't really been a history of interaction along the India-China physical border especially not the post-colonial, post-independence uh, uh, post India and post, uh, um, post uh, uh, let's say, Kuomintang China. There's not, there's, that's something that we are now struggling with and it will take time. There's also no security framework in which India and China sit down as equals and which incorporate the Himalayan region. SARC exists but China is not a member. The SCO exists, India isn't really a member, right? So there is, no, there is no infrastructure, there's no place where countries like this can sit down and talk to each other in a normal way. That means these hostilities will continue for a long time. And that's something that we have to bear in mind. Um, on top of that, because of the Kashmir dispute, India has a problem with CPEC. And because it has a problem with CPEC, it has a problem with BRI. Again, that's not going to disappear. We should, we can be optimistic, but we should make sure our dreams are based on some level of reality. And on that basis, I would, uh, I would really actually commend uh, um, the Honorable uh, Mr. Pandey on this where he talks about the way he talked about that we have to, to overcome any kind of distrust. We need to have some successes to build on. These successes, if you try to aim for the moon, if you try to aim for, okay, tomorrow everyone sits down and everybody's happy after that, I'm sorry, that's not gonna happen. So aim for things which are doable. And in that, again, I would say that countries like Nepal, the smaller mountain countries that are uh, between these countries can lead by example. They are projects that India and China can cooperate with as long as Nepal takes the lead. And these may have to be smaller projects. They can start off as research projects. They can start off at looking at the potential uh, for biodiversity in the region, 
They can look at the potential for river management. I mean, Xi Jinping, when he was in Dhaka, said we all drink from the same river. Well, this is true. All of us drink from the same rivers. But we don't have any idea about the health of these rivers. And it would be incredibly important if we talk to each other about what these river basins really are. So I have Chinese uh, journalist friends and I talk, and we met them in Kathmandu because it's harder to meet anywhere else. And we talked about, I asked them, can you report on the Indus, right? Because uh, some of the, so, uh, so it emerges out of area which is under Chinese control. And they said that that's actually very difficult for them to report on, right? Because of Chinese government constraints. Now these, these issues of mistrust can best be overcome by actually getting experts together on these type of issues. And they have an immense benefit for countries like Nepal, which need to manage their river populations better for the prosperity and sustained prosperity, not just prosperity for the big corporations, not just prosperity for the hydropower makers, but prosperity also for the people that live by these rivers. Um, and so I would suggest, and I, I would very heartily recommend uh, Mr. Pandey's point, that we start with little projects which can be successful, and we build on the successes of those projects to overcome some levels of mistrust, while bearing in mind that this problem and these deep uh, uh, issues of hostility between the countries uh, in the region will not go away. That doesn't mean we cannot cooperate. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll give ISIMOD as the as a perfect example of it. It's based in Kathmandu. It's doing phenomenal work. And uh, I, I think that's the type of uh, endeavor that can be back more um, holistically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Omar. I guess you, you, you get, we, we get you. Um, Finally, uh, I would like to ask a question to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rasid Aftab. Uh, and I would like to inform you all that uh, Dr. Wang Ping uh, has to leave uh, because of his uh, some you know, uh, urgent works out there because this is already you know, late uh, evening in Beijing now. So we, we buy him now. Uh, and uh, with, with three panelists, we will go. Uh, maybe we have uh, half an hour um, time to discuss um, on the issue. So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Aftab, um, yeah, it is recognized today that uh, the uh, security, uh, you know, of uh, especially um, the you know connecting nations of the trans. Himalayan economic corridor uh, is the one of the vital, uh, you know, uh, area. Uh, so that has to be, you know, addressed. In your opinion, you know, because uh, you you represent the, you know, um, uh, third party exactly, you know, talking about the uh, trans Himalayan, you know, economic corridor connecting from China, uh, Nepal to, um, you know, India. So what may be uh, the you know uh, potential you know security concerns that have to uh, be made by Nepal uh, to uh, implement this kind of you know project. So uh, what uh, may be your recommendations? As you already mentioned, that uh, you have a lot of experiences on the you know policy making uh, you know type of works. So with this you know experience with this regard. What may be your recommendations to Nepal so that uh, it can properly, you know, address the concerns of the security of the two giant neighbors, uh, Dr. Rasid? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the the uh, uh, Mr. Pandey Sahib has uh, also referred one aspect, uh, uh, which is related with the trust, and when the, there is a trust deficit. And this trust deficit is very uh, important uh, when there is a uh, relation in terms of the international relation. And uh, um, uh, let me give you an example. Obviously, India and Pakistan, they are not uh, on a comfortable 
relationships uh, on various fronts, a lot of differences. But even in this hostile environment, uh, uh, certain agreements or the certain treaties are still exist between India and Pakistan. And uh, the and uh, the good news is this, uh, for example, like Indus Water Treaty, which was signed somewhere in the 1960 between India and Pakistan, which is primarily is the distribution of uh, rivers system of the Indus Basin irrigation system, which is comprises of uh, th and three rivers were allocated to India and three rivers were allocated to Pakistan. And, and the uh, institutional mechanism was developed uh, in which uh, the treaty has to be implemented. In spite of uh, the various sine waves uh, comes in our relationship, that treaty still exists and that treaty is still operative. In my opinion, uh, that, uh, that uh, Nepal uh, has to, uh, at, at, uh, at one, stage it has to improve the, the trust deficit uh, and this trust deficit cannot be minimized only with the state to state interaction it has to be done at the multiple level uh, and uh, and with the multiple stakeholders like uh, for example you have arranged these webinars to deliberate uh, the various uh, uh, various aspects which has been reflected by the uh, by the various resource persons. And uh, similarly, the other institutions must engage uh, uh, and uh, they must uh, take a collaborative research uh, on the issues which becomes political in nature, which are basically, uh, uh, basically uh, like uh, technical in nature. I'll give you I, I, one more thing I must uh, reflect that uh, what is the issue that uh, this uh, project or uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, this uh, by uh, this uh, um, uh, trans uh, uh, himalaya uh, economic corridor who is going to benefit from this corridor obviously the the most vulnerable segment of society uh, of uh, the regions which uh, the people who lives in that uh, in this in that area what is the we have to look into the in terms of uh, that the poverty for instance in this whole region like uh, about 40 percent of people living below the poverty line what uh, gini index reflects there is a huge disparity there is a between the haves have and have nots which uh, gives you the picture that uh, uh, on one end there is a mm, huge wealth accumulated and other end there is absolutely nothing or and uh, on the international front we uh, all of the uh, these countries are the signatories of uh, uh, un uh, sustainable development goals for for instance which we one of the goal is to eradicate or eliminate uh, the poverty by 2030 so I think, uh, 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 and uh, since the Himalaya region is the most vulnerable area in terms of the livelihood of the poorest of the poor. So an inclusive approach, inclusive growth approach has to be pursued. And this inclusive growth approach includes uh, like obviously the citizens, uh, governments, uh, civil societies, and the private sector, unless until or a holistic approach through the involvement of these uh, critical actors is not pursued, then the success of such a uh, uh, project will be a quite challenging. And uh, uh, plus uh, the, the security aspect which you have reflected, obviously the cooperation approach has to be adopted and this cooperation has to be uh, pursued at the multiple level, whether it's on a diplomatic level whether it's, a, whether it's a peace cooperation or economic cooperation or cultural cooperation. So I believe uh, the various variables uh, have to be taken into account uh, for, the, uh, for, uh, for the benefit uh, of uh, this project must uh, reach to the 
uh, the the real uh, uh, beneficial. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have uh, another question to you, uh, Dr. Apta. <clears throat> I guess you can read uh, this question in your screen as well. That has been raised by Beam Break Me, one of the attendee of this webinar. Uh, Afghanistan, Bhutan, China. Yeah, th this is a little long. I, I would like to you know read it as it is written here. Uh, uh, Afghanistan, Bhutan, China, India, Nepal, and Pakistan are connected by high mountains. Uh, three countries with uh, atomic power, China, India, and Pakistan, should have common understanding for peace, stability, and development of the region. Otherwise, the future of SAR can be only a dream. Uh, the widening gap between rich and poor people in this region can be reduced if these countries agree to establish good political relations for making sustainable economic growth and development in Himalayan region. What is your opinion uh, on it? Uh, indirectly, in my earlier answer, I have given the answer of that uh, question as well, in which because this question is, be, the basis of this question is the widening gap between the uh, various segment of societies and the you know, viability and effectiveness of the SARC forum. The, for the SARC when was it was established somewhere in 1985. So, so obviously the objective of the SARC was uh, to undertake uh, uh, various socio-economic and uh, cultural projects which are benefit in the best interest of these countries. Uh, but uh, I don't want to go into the reasons uh, why the SARC uh, has become a teethless uh, uh, forum uh, and uh, not uh, and uh, not been uh, able to address the uh, the, uh, the objectives of the uh, of the SARC. But uh, obviously, um, uh, I fully endorsed uh, the um, uh, the question about the disparity of the wealth which exists, uh, uh, and this exists in um, in every country, every member of the SARC countries. It's not uh, uh, applicable to India or uh, 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 or to Pakistan, but every country is facing uh, the, the similar situations. Uh, the the disparity, the disparity, uh, and uh, whenever we talk about disparity, we obviously talk in terms of the poverty. And whenever we talk about the poverty, it is it means the multi-dimensional poverty. The that can be of education poverty. Poverty can be a health poverty, poverty can be a livelihood poverty, poverty can be a water poverty. So all these uh, poverties are very much relevant. And these poverties, uh, uh, these uh, various uh, uh, poverties leads to the disparity uh, between them. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is a need uh, and uh, a political will is required. Uh, from the uh, from the leaders of uh, the topmost leaders of the respective countries to engage themselves uh, or, and uh, the best forum uh, is uh, that the sark uh, may play its uh, due role which is an obligatory role on the part on the part of the on the sark uh, uh, for to undertake uh, uh, such uh, projects which are which must not be a uh, uh, country centric but it's uh, must be a regional uh, and uh, and uh, the basic uh, philosophies of this uh, uh, of these projects must be i think uh, they have to account for the triple helix model in the triple helix model the three actors are very critical one is the government provide the conducive uh, policy environment and uh, the second actor is the private sector uh, and the third is the uh, universities and the research and development organizations which uh, which are responsible for uh, for uh, giving the innovative solutions and the private sector invests uh, in in that particular sector so this uh, uh, this relationship has is required uh, to build up uh, so that uh, the region uh, can uh, can prosper uh, like uh, other regions of the world and still we are uh, in the trap of uh, discussing more disputes uh, rather than discussing more, uh, uh, like uh, cooperation uh, instruments uh, 
which already ex although the, the those uh, instruments exist we do have a lot of common things to be discussed instead of uh, going into the conflicts and disputes uh, uh, and uh, zero gum uh, 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 zero sum games thank you thank you so much uh, dr aftab uh, now i will turn to uh, mr omay ahmed uh, as this discussion is a little long and Sure. Go ahead. I prefer to go with uh, the you know uh, extra, extract of the question. Um, uh, in the tenure of uh, Prime Ministership of uh, uh, Pushpa Kamal Dahal Prachanda, the Nepal's former Prime Minister, he expre Nepal expressed about the trilateral strategic cooperation between um, India, China, and Nepal. Uh, and it is uh, important for the peace, uh, security, and stability, uh, as most of the Nepali people think. Uh, if this concept gets uh, succeeded, the Himalayan nation Nepal can serve as a bridge between the two Asian economic giants, and it will be a great opportunity for this reason. What do you think about this, Mr. Omer? I think it's a nice idea. I'm not sure whether it will work in practice. Um, you know, as a student of international relations, it's not advisable, and I have I have not seen any historical uh, incident where a smaller country can actually act as a bridge between two large countries which have suspicions about each other, which have deep suspicions. So what happens is if there is a country in the middle, it gets carved up and it gets pushed really hard by both sides. It actually exacerbates tensions. It doesn't lower them. And uh, I mean, the most uh, famous example of this would be Germany between in the Cold War, which was physically divided and, uh, you know, ruled by the Soviet Union on one side and the allied powers on the other. And that did not actually benefit the Germans at all. Uh, so while I think it's an interesting idea, I, it would be better if there was an institutional system in which Nepal, India, and China could sit together and talk, but it would be better for it to be a wider institutional system that way that the pressure wouldn't just be on Nepal from both India and China. Because if there were, if uh, the suspicions aren't going to go away, and if there was a decision that was done by Nepal that seemed to favor one country over the other, the other country would be upset and would pressurize uh, Nepal that much more. And that would put Nepal into a very difficult position. Uh, so I would suggest that that may not be the way to go. There are better ways in which you could maybe lower the level of representation. Uh, now that Nepal is under its new constitution, a much more federal country, you could look at uh, the countries bordering uh, the Chinese border and the country uh, and the provinces uh, 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 bordering uh, China and uh, provinces bordering India and see if you can build cooperation between them and the province, whether it's TAR in China or, you know, Bihar and, and UP in India, that type of thing. Again, I'm not sure that that will work. My, my uh, question would be, why not involve the other countries in this? Why not involve uh, Bangladesh? Why not involve Bhutan? Why not involve Burma? Why not involve Pakistan? Uh, so you will have a lot more flexibility in the system. That would be my, uh, my view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will turn to Mr. Pandey. Uh, we have uh, two questions to you. Uh, maybe then after we will wrap up the session with the uh, 
few concluding uh, remarks uh, that you would like to, uh, you know, uh, put forward in this webinar as a last comment. Uh, Mr. Pandey, considering region's huge workforce, uh, one market and potential for quick economic growth, shouldn't we encourage our regional private sector to lead, lead these initiatives jointly? Did you get the question? You are muted, please. You have to unmute. Pardon? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, please. I can. Yeah, yeah, I can do. You can see uh, the question in your, um, uh, your 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 screen as well that has been raised by an uh, anonymous, uh, anonymous attendee. Considering reasons, use workforce, one market, and uh, potential for quick economic growth, uh, shouldn't we encourage our regional private sector to lead these initiatives jointly? This is about the joint uh, initiative uh, of the government uh, with the uh, uh, private sector for this initiative. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, a very good question. Uh, uh, in Nepalese, uh, in uh, Nepal's development, we are talking uh, since long time uh, for the uh, foreign direct investment as well as the uh, investment from the uh, neighboring countries, India, China, to come to have a to settle the uh, to set up the. Uh, factories and other uh, other things, uh, and it will help uh, two things. One, the employment issues. Another issue is uh, uh, poverty reduction, and as well as it can <clears throat> it can also help our uh, foreign currency deficit. You know, we are uh, we have heavy uh, expenses uh, on importing uh, goods and services from outside the countries especially the uh, energy, fossil fuel, petroleum and diesel. Uh, only we are importing from India 300 billion per year. So if we can uh, develop electricity, hydropower project in Nepal, that can help to reduce our uh, energy import and as well as we can develop our industry uh, <coughs> in Nepal. Uh, and we always uh, inviting them, but due to different reason, it is not been realized until today. Uh, the FDI, many people, they are coming and they are tucking in Nepal uh, and they, they are showing their interest for the investment in Nepal. But uh, in practice, the result is very minimal. So uh, for this one, we have to uh, change our policies and we have to uh, handle the hurdles uh, the business community is facing. So we have to re uh, reduce the hurdles um, and bureaucratic, bureaucratic hassles should be reduced and uh, the faith should be created. That is, the, our domestic uh, 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 weaknesses, we have to resolve it and side by side. Uh, I uh, And we have to see the new scenario because China is going to high tech industries and the, the low tech uh, uh, industries and the laborers. Uh, the, this type of practice are going to replace from China even uh, <coughs> they are going to other countries, even Bangladesh and other areas. So even Indian entrepreneur, they are interested to come to Nepal. So why not we encourage these people to come to Nepal? Uh, this is uh, necessary and government should have to take uh, responsibility to convince and to give, to give the confidence to protect their investment and guarantee of their profit and uh, a repatriation process then I, I think in future that will be happen. That is uh, necessary. Uh, and I will, I, I will uh, another things regarding, as you mentioned earlier, this um, the yam between two countries. Previously we were talking about the Nepal as a yam between two countries, two giant nations. 
Right now we are talking about the, the bridge between two countries, not a am. So can we be the bridge between these countries and all these investors and other people can come to Nepal and, ex and do their business from, from one part to another part. If we can create a, 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 this, create the a positive environment in Nepal, I think in near future, if we can uh, develop uh, this energy deficit, we can, you know, we can address the energy deficit issues and other issues. Uh, certainly, it is possible. So we have to work ourselves. And um, from my side also, to, uh, for the two gentlemen uh, from China and India uh, and even Pakistan, I, uh, <clears throat> I request to have a business to come to Nepal uh, to invest in Nepal, there is the possibility of uh, investment and profit because Nepal only, it's not the small country. There is 30 million people. If we go to, in the Europe to collect 30 million people, there should be five, 10 countries. Uh, they have to move around. So uh, in the future, the market, Nepal, Nepali market also going to be increased. Uh, that can be captured by the business people by the, by the entrepreneur and uh, from them we can learn how to make the business in Nepal also. Thank China you. has has done miraculous practices in the past 40 years but now they are teaching to the world how to make the business, how to get the money. So we can learn from them also. From India, uh, We can learn. The Indian people also can learn from uh, Chinese people how to make the business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pandey. We will come back to you. There is a question for you. Uh, but uh, before that, um, I would prefer to go with uh, uh, Mr. Omer. There is a question uh, to you. Uh, maybe you have already seen that. This is by Nandita Kargi, one of the attendees. Uh, I think uh, we, we may not be able to take more questions than this and another one that has been already posted in the box. So um, we are sorry, um, all the attendees. We have to uh, wrap up the session um, around five. So the question is, um, Mr. Omer, uh, it's well profound that uh, EHEC, Trans Himalayan Economic Corridor, can transform the entire South Asian Himalayan sub region and the Ganges Basin to robust economic growth. In the discussion, the panelists talked uh, about uh, certainly bridging the major cities. Wouldn't such economic corridors be more effective in the sub-regions? Uh, if, sorry, if the sub-regions are more integrated, such as the possible four economic corridors in Nepal and CIM? Did you Absolutely. guess? Absolutely. I think uh, that if you leave the sub-regions out, you're not going to have a uh, development model that will work. Because the thing is, uh, if, you, if you bulldoze over the opinion of, uh, of the sub-regions, you're going to have protests. That will slow down anything that moves forward. You have to incorporate local opinion. Unle without that, I mean, a model of just uh, bigger actors, corporate houses, or countries pushing through is just not going to work. I mean, India and Nepal have this long history of these major projects uh, that we are committed to. And we have not really been able to manage them properly because we have not incorporated the voice of local communities. And that means firstly that the local communities suffer, uh, especially in many of our embankment projects. Um, that, and that creates a political problem for both countries. On top of that, Economically, often you, if you do not incorporate local opinions and local, uh, local in interests and uh, incorporate uh, the needs of the sub-regions, uh, quite often what you have is un uh, uncertain economic costs. And those economic costs sometimes end up being more costly than the benefits you get from one big project. So I cannot agree more with that. I just say one thing to uh, Mr. Pandey. 
when I mean by small country, I mean, I gave the example of Germany divided between the allied powers in the Soviet Union. Germany is not a small country, nor is it a small economic opportunity. But if you have one country, which is proportionately smaller to, to large hostile powers, it can wreck the economy of even the most robust economy. And Germany's economy is one of the most robust in the world. Um, so I did, I'm sorry if it came across as disrespectful. I did not mean that at all. Uh, I'm aware that quite often Indian remarks on Nepal are disrespectful. I, please, I, please accept my apologies if that is how it came across. Thank you. Thank you for being frank as well, uh, Mr. Omer. Uh, uh, lastly, um, there is a question to uh, uh, Mr. Spandi. Uh, I request uh, um, all the panelists, you know, to maybe you, you are busy, but uh, we will be wrapping up the session within five minutes. So please be brief. Uh, Mr. Pandey, uh, what do you think the effect of, uh, um, you know, India's not being uh, the part of uh, BRI, uh, you know, um, be, despite it, it is the, uh, ultimate neighbor of China, and what may be the you know uh, effect, possible effect uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, you know uh, that has been assessed that uh, uh, these two kind of strategies um, can have a more rival position of the two powers uh, in the region. So, what uh, is your assessment regarding these two you know big strategies by these two superpowers? Uh, regarding this kind of, you know, economic, making this kind of economic corridor in between these two, you know, rivaling, in a sense, countries. Please, brief, Mr. Pandey, you, you are muted, you have to unmute, please. Very, very important and very, uh, uh, this question is, uh, is uh, it has controversies and, and different uh, critical opinion also. Uh, my opinion is uh, BRI uh, and we, uh, we can't uh, say to any country, you must have to join or uh, not to join in any uh, such type of initiative. Uh, we, we should encourage uh, with friendly way uh, regarding to join in BRI or other issues, but uh, so uh, India still uh, is uh, not willing to join BRI. That is their, uh, maybe they have certain apprehension or whatever. Um, the uh, main responsibility to convince uh, in this uh, initiative is uh, I give to the responsibility to the China side. They have to convince uh, to others. There is no any politics. There is no any uh, 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 overt or covert strategy with this initiative. Then that they, they, they can convince to other other partners, other friends. Uh, in second issues regarding Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, my, my opinion, still India is in dilemma, whether to join Indo-Pacific or not. So uh, they have not uh, decided yet to engage in this initiative or not. As a growing power, I think India will not be the part of the any big power. They themselves are trying to to go up to the ladder in the top. They have also the contradiction, but due to as a border country, China and India, sometimes their differences can be used by others. That's why they have to sit together and they have to resolve the issue by themselves. Uh, and I think they are, Working together also, you can see one issue very recently, 
when the, the border issues, border dispute was going on was um, um, last week, last month, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, when the leaders were in Moscow, they arranged one meeting in the initiative of the Russian political leaders, Russian ministers, Russian president. And they, they came to certain agreement with five point agreement and this settles a certain uh, uh, resolve the issue and they have certain agreement. That's why there are so many angles, so many factors that are working each other. So in, in this issues also in, in the Indo-Pacific, immediately after, you know, in near future, I'm not sure India will join or not. They are also looking very cautiously whether to join or not. And Nepal also should have to work in this situation with different, you know, emerging issues, emerging powers, what they are doing. We are, we are also looking and how to, uh, how to deal all these things coming up in the, in the table. So uh, uh, we have to, Nepali as a Nepal, also should have to work very smartly, very cleverly with the neighbors, with the force uh, uh, in, in aligned with the Nep Nep Nepal's, Afno Nepal's interest, national interest. We have to preserve, we have to go, we have to uh, work on our national interest and we have to uh, make our relationship in this line, in, this, in the light of the national interest. That is, I think, that's why we ourselves also not to join, not to criticize to each other regarding one or another issue by, their, uh, by, by the uh, great powers, great to neighbors. That's why I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting to, to the friends to criticize or to, to do another way uh, in this issue. They are doing themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pondley, for optimistic and maybe realistic view from your side. And uh, we are now in the ease of the session. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to the chair of the session, I would like I would like to request uh, the distinguished panelists uh, to, uh, uh, to, to say a few words, maybe within three or four sentences, uh, as their uh, as their focus, or uh, if there are something that has been left behind to 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 tell from your side. So, Dr. Uh, Rasid Aptab, please, from your side, if you want to put uh, add, add some more ideas from your side, uh, please. Very I I think uh, much has uh, already been uh, discussed uh, by all the uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, we have covered most of the things, but I still believe uh, that uh, uh, that uh, is some uh, sort of uh, um, uh, like uh, identification of the projects and uh, some kind of innovative uh, uh, thinking process may be carried out uh, in order to map various potential, uh, not only map with various potential uh, in accordance with that uh, particular area, but also try to develop uh, uh, some sort of a framework where, which may be comprises of implementation plan. Usually what happened that uh, uh, mostly uh, that, uh, that implementation plan uh, is, uh, uh, is not uh, fully deliberated. Uh, uh, so, uh, and that implementation plan uh, must speak uh, about uh, the responsibilities and the allocations of the resources uh, uh, in accordance with that, uh, uh, the scope of the project. And uh, that has to be, and that has to be done by taking uh, the community uh, at board, uh, because uh, unless the communities are not involved. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, would be difficult uh, uh, to get uh, the impact of that project. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Omair Ahmed, would you like to add some points from your side as a concluding uh, you know, remarks from your side? Yeah. Um, so I, I think I've already spoken more than enough. 
I, I just uh, would like to say that if Nepal wishes to take a leadership role in this, it has to identify what it is its own unique, uh, what it brings to the table. And I think uh, one of the things that has, uh, that has not been given enough consideration is its own local biodiversity and the richness of its own country. So uh, I think that uh, if uh, Nepal wishes to play a leadership role, and I think that that's a great idea that it should, it needs to focus on its unique uh, capabilities, what it brings to the table. And for that, it needs to make sure it incorporates uh, local communities, their local knowledge, and especially the knowledge often of women and marginalized communities such as tribal mountain communities, right? Uh, so I think if Nepal focuses on that internally, it will be a stronger act in negotiating externally. Thank you. Thank you for your robust idea to take the marginalized people in the mainstream of the development. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mr. Omeir Ahmed. And now, finally, I would like to uh, request uh, Honorable Former Minister and Member of Parliament, Mr. Surendra Pandey, uh, to uh, very briefly to add some conclu uh, concluding remarks from his side, if there is any. Uh, no. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, I will. Uh, I will say only two words. Uh, as you started this initiative, it's quite fruitful. Uh, it should be continued. Uh, second thing is uh, uh, political and a diplomatic uh, channel is not only sufficient. Uh, we have to use other issues, other channels that should be the multiple uh, with the multiple stakeholders, and we can create the uh, positive atmosphere, uh, conducive atmosphere for. Uh, this initiative. So uh, try to work in from many front, not from the, not from the only one front. Uh, today also there are so many export people that are from the different uh, sector of the society. So that should be continued. And uh, uh, in the future we can uh, have certain specific issues, a specific problem and a specific issues. If we can talk on certain issues and we can collect or we can discuss on those issues, on that issue. And then another time in another issue. That way, uh, if we can start, that may be the one process to reach in certain conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pandey. With this all, uh, I guess I have not to, you know, take much time as uh, there is a still, uh, you know, uh, chairman of the uh, webinar. Um, so, I may I request uh, the chair of this webinar, Dr. Risi Raza Dikari, to conclude uh, the session with few words from his side. Dr. Dikari. Thank you very much, Sukhaji. <clears throat> Namaste, everybody. Representatives, Honorable Narendra Pandey, Foreign Minister of Finance. Dr. Wang Peng, Deputy Director and Researcher from Renmin University based in China. Mr. Omar Ahmad, Political Analyst from New Delhi, India. Dr. Rashid Aftab, Director, Refai Institute of Public Policy, Islamabad, Pakistan. Other distinguished personnel with expertise and interest in regional affairs, foreign policy, and economic policies. Friends from media, my friends from near. A very good afternoon to everybody. Let me express my heartfelt thanks to all of you, and I'm delighted for your active participation and, and contributions in the preceding deliberation. Extensive views have been shared and much has been discussed this afternoon on trans and economic court. I would not prefer to repeat. Meantime, let me share briefly that with the settlement of political rankings in Nepal, now the time of prosperity for the people and development of the country is overdue. We simply cannot continue the so-called transition phase forever. Attempts are underway to harness the natural resources with the use of technology and cooperation with other friendly countries around. 
Trans Himalayan Economic Corridor is a project with major potential for transforming this poor and underdeveloped region into economically viable, rich, and developed one. This region needs a push in infrastructure invest, investments coupled with far more robust annual economic growth rates to meet the challenges posed by its poverty, mass, and massive underdevelopment and underemployment. Nepal has made it clear that it wishes to act as a vibrant Himalayan land bridge between Central and South and Southeast Asia. Thus, it would welcome the Southern BRI to be connected with Europe and also welcome the extension of this Chinese railway into Kathmandu and Lumiri, the birthplace of Lord Buddha. Beijing, meanwhile, is well aware of the political sensitivities in Delhi to creating a corridor connecting Kathmandu and Beijing. Four economic corridors are possible in Nepal in the literature, the Karnali Economic Corridor, the Gandak Economic Corridor, the Bagmati Economic Corridor, and Kosi Economic Corridor. To underscore economic corridors are perfect tools for sub-regional cooperation through devolution of responsibility and authority to local bodies and communities. They, use, they need seamless connectivity by road, rail, waterway, roadway, grids, etc. But importantly, the markets must be integrated and supported by financial cooperation by local governments and banks with the risk judicially shared by all the central governments. Trilateralism. When we talk of economic corridors in this region, trilateralism is very important factor between China, India, and Nepal. Nepal's then Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal Prachanda coined the concept of trilateral strategic relations involving India, China, and Nepal in 2010. He believed that this concept would address concerns of all three at once. Responses to some queries that the organizers posed have been presented by speakers today and some still need detailed analysis and research. And, and this was an interesting later on. I can, I can add a little bit uh, on some questions that has not been dealt with. Can Nepal manage itself to address the security concerns of the exact neighbors to implement this, con this concept? Is the concept technically viable, economically maintainable, and geopolitically acceptable in the current situation? What role Nepal should play to start implementing this project? So this is all for today. Once again, I thank you all. I close this afternoon's important webinar. We will meet soon over the other important issues. I request for your support in needs future in the future. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, all the panelists, all the attendees, and all the Facebook watchers. We will see you again. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us.